Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Fan Fiction Tapes. I'm your host today, Maya, pronouns she, her, and today I'm joined by... Uh, pronouns Dylan, uh, yeah, he, him. Pronouns Dylan. Yeah, <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> oh, uh, Steve, he, him. No one tells me how this works, by the way, I didn't know I... <laughs> it's right there in the, right in the script! Oh. Okay, that's, that's fair. <laughs> and I am our frustrated producer, Ian, <laughs> pronouns he, him. <laughs> Uh, okay, I will, right. there's there's a lot of this I won't take responsibility for. I will take responsibility for that. That's on me. Today's episode is a trope roundtable on the Moe's scale of sci-fi hardness. Now, some of you may be asking yourselves, what the f*** is hard sci-fi, Maya, and why is there a scale of hardness for it? Now, that's an excellent question, and answering it is... Kind of tricky. So, the concept of hard sci-fi, theoretically, is a science fiction novel that has emphasis on the science part. Think something like The Martian as being an example of very hard science fiction. Then, of course, this contrasts with soft sci-fi being more akin to Star Wars, where the fiction and the fantasies more the point than the science of it, necessarily. And the scale... There's actually a scale available on TV trips, which I'm going to kind of read off and then talk about, which has six levels, which is cringe, because the real Mo's scale has, I think, ten. They should have at least gone for ten. Okay, scientist. Calm down. But there is Science Indie Genre Only, uh, which is a name that has surely aged well, <laughs> where it's a work that is definitely in the literary genre of science fiction, but it's not, you know, as I mentioned earlier, particularly science. World of Phlebotanum, which is a name, <laughs> is kind of the next hardest level of science fiction where there's a science of a sort, which is, I believe, what it refers to with phlebotanum, and it's kind of consistent within itself, but not necessarily corresponding to the real world. After that is Physics Plus, which is more justified in response to both real-world physics and invented magic physics. Uh, the TV Trips article for this lists uh, Favorite of Steam and Ian, David Weber's Honor Harrington series, although personally, I don't know if it should actually be there from what I've been told of the physics. What category did they put it in? Physics Plus, which is a three on a six point scale. I can buy that. No, it's it's pretty much in the right place. I can buy that because they do like, aside from all the wacky stuff about gravity sails, they are yeah. blowing each other up with nukes. Laser pumped nukes, which is... No, no, no. Other way around. They're blowing each other up with nuke pumped lasers. Or wait, sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, the the nuke, reason I, I bring that up is the four point on the scale. One big lie where the author invents one or at most a very few fake physics laws and writes a story that explores the implication of those principles. Which, that to me sounds like what you've told me about Honor Harrington. There's a little bit more than one big lie in Honor Harrington. There are a um, lot of big lies. The things that are not big lies are played straight, but there are a lot of big lies. Yeah. <laughs> it's It's... It's definitely in the physics plus category, but it's kind of closer to the one big lie end. Uh, and then a five on this scale is labeled on TV trips as speculative science, where there isn't really a big lie, but the science is legit and tracks to what we know of physical laws. And then the sixth point on the scale is real life. 
which is basically just something about the real world. I'm looking I'm looking at the TV tropes and it's 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 kind of funny how 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 they describe that last one. Yes, the uh real life category of the TV tropes Moe's scale uh science fiction hardness include the Apollo program, World War II, and Woodstock. <laughs> I particularly like the line, a shared universe which spawned its own genre known as nonfiction. Someone at TV Trips was having a good day when they wrote that. So, just looking at uh, the scale, uh, where do you guys typically find your enjoyment? I honestly enjoy stuff all over the place, but some of the stuff of when I'm in a hard sci-fi mood, three to five is the sweet zone. Because as I mentioned, I'm a fan of Andy Weir's The Martian, which is honestly almost like a 5.5 or even a 5.75 on the scale. Uh, as far as I know, all of these signs is accurate and it's very realistically not far off from the current future. I think, like, the big wrench in the entire thing is the ion propulsion of the Hermes ship, which is something we haven't quite worked out yet in real life. But something you could do. No, it's something you can do. But... Like, if I, it's not necessarily can we work it out by that time frame. Okay. Um, Ian, Steamed, where do you find yourself on this scale? It doesn't particularly make a difference to me, to be honest. I. Well, actually, no, that's fair. Um... Yeah, because sometimes you feel like Destiny, sometimes you feel like Halo, and sometimes you feel like something a little bit harder. Yeah, it doesn't frankly make a huge difference to me. Ian, any particular number that you find yourself attached to at the moment? <laughs> I think a lot of my particular favorite science fiction stuff tends to fall around the three on here. I think that's the most... Three and four are the most interesting areas to write within. Can I surprise you guys? Okay. I'm a one. <laughs> I, that's not a surprise at all, Ian. <laughs> yeah, I am... Uh, in terms of, like, sci-fi, it's like, the more you science it, the more my my brain is just like, mm, uh-huh. Yeah, Dylan complains when I bring engineering to the table. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've noticed how you react whenever we attempt to actually use math in games. <laughs> it's It's not math, it's like... Okay, this number that I clearly didn't, like, account for, you're just asking me right now? No, sorry, I don't know the the amount of jewels this explosion is. I have never once asked that. I know, but I, I fear you will, and that fear is enough to keep me up at night. Worry not, I will never ask you how many jewels that explosion is. Uh, because if I ever ask a question about the energy of an explosion, I'm going to be asking about megatons of TNT. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much my thing. Like, looking at it, I might dip my toe into two. Freeze a bit far for me. <laughs> you know. I also guess that the further you go down the line, I feel like... Like, I don't want to say, like loses focus on the things that I care about in a story. But it's just things I don't care about take up a lot more space. Not that it replaces things that I would care about. It replaces things I don't, but or like have like neutral feelings on. But ah, I just don't care. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 valid, that's fair. Um for me it's interesting because I work with science all the time. Shocker. And it can be kind of nice to see that in my personal life in a way that's not mind-numbing homework problems. But if that's not your thing, that's not your thing. Yeah, it's like, I want, like, a mystery, a lot of questions, give me some f***ing romance, give me 
a cool ideas and concepts that you know it's like a science but without the science i w- okay <laughs> that's i can get I you want. a I, I think this is ian have you read project hail mary i don't think steam has no what do you mean? i haven't read it yet it's still sitting here on my desk i read it i have i have a pile of andy weir novels sitting in front of me right now uh i have them on the other side of my other chair because my bookcase has recently been actually organized in alphabetical order. I would say Project Hail Mary is probably like a 3, maybe a 3.5. Mm-hmm. And it has mystery. It has questions. I'd almost put it at a 4. I think there's a couple of too many big lies for a 4. From I haven't read it, but like... I know vaguely what's going on with it, and it's kind of closer to Honor Harrington in terms of the number of big lies going on. I think everything follows naturally once you accept the magic space up. Most of it, but if you're going to like a harder sci-fi book, Dylan, I think that might be one of the ones for you. It doesn't have any romance, but... Well, trash. Uh, (laughs) No, uh, but... It's like when I when I speak about Xenoblade, which is speculative fiction, but edges on that sci-fi area. Like what they usually do is it's like we establish a rule and or other rules, and then we see how those rules are broken, the exceptions, and what those rules mean in like sort of a character sense. Like, oh, these giant robots can't be hurt by any of our weapons except for this one. And then immediately, as soon as you get access to that weapon, it's like, huh, we can't hit this one specific giant robot that is slightly different. Why is that? <laughs> like, that's what I love. It's like, okay, we've set the precedent. And immediately we've told you, okay, that's not the case anymore. Uh, that's unfortunate for you. Let's figure that out. <laughs> and that's what I sort of love in my storytelling is... Okay, let's set up a rule, and this rule is universal. And then we're going to break that rule, crumple it into a piece of paper, throw that in the garbage, and now you've got to learn the entire thing again. And even at times, you'll go back to when you thought that the rule was universal and go, wait a minute, it was never universal. <laughs> it's all been a lie. <laughs> but right, I love you've that. you've never studied higher-level physics. Um... <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's you described a lot of the learning process for high level physics in <laughs> the that red. That's what it's like. I, I I think you could do that with a hard sci fi novel. I think you could do that with a four point five, maybe a five. It'd be tricky though. Yeah, I guess the it's typically that I don't like. It, it's complicated to explain because you're like Dylan. All these things will work, but I, I don't know if it's like the setting. The type of, I don't feel smart enough to read a four. (laughs) Or that typically that element I'll like, but I don't find like the other elements I like in and amongst it. It depends, you know. But yeah, that's how I feel. So you want to tell me like what you think of the scale in general, though? Do you think it's good? I actually dislike the scale, because I think it kind of misses the point. So, and I'm going to bring up fantasy here, and I'm going to bring up... Um, Let's go. <laughs> is it Sanderson? It's, it's Sanderson. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everything it's... Sanderson is a hard to, and I Fell's going to explain why, I think. Yes. There's also hard and soft magic, which we haven't really talked about at length on the show, but... Uh, we talked about high and low fantasy. Uh, <laughs> not quite. It's different. It's different. Right, where was I? Sanderson. Sanderson's magic system is often somewhat inspired or based upon real-world physics and chemistry. And then he goes and does like really wacky shit with it. But the consistency and the rules of Sanderson's universe make it feel a lot more like 
a hard sci-fi work than books that just have a lot of real science in them necessarily. I I think the more interesting thing is the consistent mechanics of the rules. Whether or not those rule mechanics are understood by the readers and the characters the entire time is a different thing. Right, so I think the important part is not necessarily where do you fall on the scale. The important part is do you have consistent rules and how are you using them in the story? In Sanderson's works, there are, there's a very consistent set of rules, and I'm sure Sanderson has, like, a book somewhere on his desk labeled with everything that can and can't happen and how it works. Sanderson knows this. The readers don't, and the rules are often plot critical. So then the story works on the characters discovering the mechanics of the systems they are trapped in and how to fight them. And that's a very satisfying way to set things up, I think. There's also quite a few... Uh plot points where characters come to incorrect conclusions about the rules and suffer the consequences. And then I think, like, if you go back to Honor Harrington, the rules are critical to the setting, right? Because you can't have a story about making hard choices if there are no rules to enforce the hard choices. So you say, oh, well, I know this missile barrage will destroy this fleet because we've established that that's the mechanics of the setting, but if I destroy this fleet, I won't have the resources left to save this planet or whatever. So I think it's about how you use the rules and how consistently you enforce them. And I think having a set of rules that you consistently enforce makes a better story if that's the kind of story you're interested in telling. Obviously, if you're just, if you're doing a very character-focused story, the mechanics of the setting might not even really come into play. And I, I think I think there's also one more dimension to the scale here, which is why the rules exist. I think yes. I think this is a big difference, particular this is a big breaking point, particularly between three and four, because the the one big lie level, you have only a few either one big or a few small breaks from, you know, reality reality, like the expanse. But the purpose of those breaks in reality is to say, look at this thing. What if this thing were real? Wouldn't that be f***ed up? (laughs) Whereas in the case of like Honor Harrington, the reason that the David Weber has chosen to um, make physics work a little differently than reality there is because he wants to tell Horatio Hornblower in space. It's the the purpose of the breaks is not to tell a story about what life would be like if that was real. It's kind of comes at it the other way around, right? If we were to right now to make a scale like this for like another genre, uh, like fantasy is always one that you can talk about in like various magic systems, like fantasy on a scale goes from like <laughs> real life history <laughs> to like i don't know what a um the opposite of just like a historical drama would be <laughs> yeah i don't know. controversial take i think you can map fantasy directly onto this scale with no major changes pretty much yeah uh, uh, yeah i mean I-, I think the scale itself needs changes but i think you can map fantasy on there without doing too much is it a genre you can't? How do you wrap, put romance on, on that scale? Uh, locked tomb. <laughs> you gonna explain? Oh, Wait, where are you no. putting locked tomb on the scale? I that that is actually that something is... I wanted to bring up was mm. because there are very clearly explicit rules about the world, mechanisms through which the magic happens. All kinds of stuff like that. However, none of our perspective characters ever understand these rules. Yeah, so that, as long as the readers can tell there are rules, they don't need to know what the rules are. Knowing that there are rules, but that they don't know what they are and none of the characters do, can actually make a very good story. Honestly, the Log Tomb might be a three. 
I would hard disagree maybe, with that. Maybe 2.5. I don't, I don't think you can I, ever classify it above a three, but I don't think it's a one. Oh no, it's not a one, because there is there is some implication impl- implication mm, <laughs> the words there is some implication of the effects of scientific laws, largely ones about distance, but still. Well, what well, your guys' opinion on like a fantasy one would be like? Uh, a five. If we say six is like just like history, I think it would be sort of like you know those like stuff like Rome and the Last Kingdom, where it's like this is like on the same line, but we're changing some stuff here. <laughs> oh, fantasy five. Yeah. No, no. I, I think that's like fantasy six. I think a fantasy five ends up coming out the same as a sci-fi five. Uh, so, like, spe- because speculative history. If you're in a fantasy five, you can't have magic, right? And if you're in a sci fi five, you can't have anything that we don't know is physically possible today. So, in terms of speculative so it history, comes, it would be along they the same lines. At five on the scale, I think. I so, think, I think, I think with with fantasy, if you try, if you map this onto the scale and you try to hit a five on fantasy, I think what you end up at is alternate history. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't I don't think it needs to be alternate, but it has to be like we're expanding on like a on like an era we know little about. Like that's what the TV show Rome is. It's oh yeah, Caesar mentioned these two guys in one speech. What why why don't we put these guys in like important places during the, the role you know, or that maybe, uh, era? I think maybe Harry Turtle though. Because all of his stories are premised on, like, one roll of the dice goes differently at a certain historical event and completely changes the course of history. Forrest Gump. Yeah, Forrest Gump is five. <laughs> <laughs> on, a fa- on the fantasy scale, Forrest Gump, five. <laughs> Prove me wrong, America. <laughs> I think we've brain damaged steamed. <laughs> Wait, why? You made a couple of, like, the you-don't-know-how-to-respond noises you make, and then never said anything. No, that's true, I did do that, yeah. That, that, that's what happens when you break. So, if, we, <laughs> if we're gonna continue our mark, what, what's, like, a four? Are we talking what is then... What a four? Are we then talking, like, are we getting into, like, superhero stuff then? So or are Ian, we still a step away? You've read, I presume, the Furies of Calderon books. Uh, yes. Yes, I have. I think that could potentially be a 4 or a 3-5. Interesting. I think it's probably closer to a 3-5 than an actual 4 on account of... All the magic? Yeah. Yeah. For for those who aren't familiar with that series, it's, um... Uh, it's, it's a series by Jim Butcher... That, if I recall correctly, he wrote on a bet as a mashup of uh, Pokemon and a lost Roman legion. And the idea here is that there's this alternate reality where sometimes um, people stumble through, and a it, it there's magic and elementals cult that they call Furies. And a bunch of Romans stumble into this alternate world, disappear from Earth, and have to set up an entirely new Roman civilization, which they do by learning to harness the power of these elemental beings. So I can I can see where you're you're coming into the 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 three or the four here from because it's you know you what if this lost Roman legion had to restart civilization in a place with magic, but I think that's more physics plus than one big lie. Because again, I'm going to come back to this where the difference between three and four, the big break point here is, are you changing the rules of physics to support your story? Or are you writing a story to explore a change in physics? Do you you get what I'm coming at there? Hmm. So I, On the fantasy, what separates a one from a two, in your opinion? 
Like, do we say that, like, Ice and Fire is a two, and Lord of the Rings is a one? I don't know if I would say that. Well, will you put Ice and Fire at one as well? Or would you put Ice and Fire down at, like, three? <laughs> I don't know if I'd put Lord of the Rings at a one. Lord of the Rings has what? Had misfire. Lord of the Rings has rules, but they're not the rules we recognize when we approach this from a hard sci-fi perspective. Or from a sci-fi perspective. Because the rules of the setting are like moral rules, if that makes sense. And we all know that sci-fi fans hate morality. <laughs> or, well, and because there are two aspects of it, right? What is that the things that are not magic in the setting fully play by the rules. I There's a great series I read by a uh, Roman military historian who runs a blog analyzing the wars in Lord of the Rings because Tolkien read so much like early European history that you can analyze the battles in his setting on the same basis. You can analyze the wars of Lord of the Rings like they're wars between early British kingdoms, and it comes out. And that tracks as well, because given that the Lord of the Rings was kind of intended as, like, making up British folklore. Because, so for one, Tolkien likes having rules in his setting, clearly, and makes a lot of rules in his setting because it's a fun exercise for him. He is the original world. <laughs> um... But then also, the magic in the setting does play by rules. It's just that they, they're they not, like, rule rules. They're, like, Gandalf says, you shall not pass. And because Gandalf is more built different than the Balrog, the Balrog cannot pass. That's just how it happens. <laughs> so what, what do we quantify a two as? Would you quantify Lord of the Rings as a two or a one? I think I think um, Lord of the Rings is a two. So what would you quantify as a one? Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is no consistency. There is no internal logic. It's <laughs> just Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> if you can convince this one dude sitting at the table that what you're doing is cool and or funny enough. It happens. I feel like we've said this on the show before. Uh-huh. So, in terms of my Ice and Fire question, then, does Ice and Fire sit in the same place as Lord of the Rings, or is it a free? I know basically nothing about Ice and Fire, because you tell me things about it, and then it goes out the other ear. I don't think you can put Game of Thrones... You cannot put Game of Thrones higher on the scale than... Or, sorry, you cannot put Game of Thrones closer to reality on the scale than Lord of the Rings. Wherever it goes, I will stand by that. That is a hard mm. line. I, suppo I suppose the argument is, ultimately, Ice and Fire is still a very human-based story. Like, it has dragons, it has, like, ice zombies. But that's about the limit, and... Well, okay, I'll no. It also has... I apologize, you started a rant. Mm -hmm. um, okay, <laughs> so the thing about A Song of Ice and Fire is that it wants to be, like, hard reality. It's just there's a little dragons, there's a little ice goblins. And it, it wants to be taken seriously as a fictional history. But if you look at the act, what's actually happening, it's not really physically possible. It's a good story, but it doesn't have a str any stronger claim to reality than Lord of the Rings does. I think it's the attempt, though. Well, I don't. Lord of the Rings is an attempt. It's just that Lord of the Rings is so foundational to Western fantasy that we don't see that anymore. That is also a good point. So, where would you put them? So, where would, would you put, put Ice and Fire? I would put it in a two. It's internally consistent. It's, it is using the set dressing of playing by the rules more than it is actually playing by the rules. But it is playing by its own rules, and that's fine. Okay, so Raymond E. Feist has a series of books called the, I think, the Chronicles. It's a shit ton of books. 
The first ones are Magician, Master, Magician, Apprentice. I've talked about them before on the series. Ian, have you read them? I don't think so. Uh, I know Steam hasn't read them because I've been waiting to shove them down his throat. Um, but they have a very firmly set uh, rules of magic that operate. I think it's honestly, even though there's a lot of magic, it's a little bit harder because of the consistency of the magic and some of some of the inclusion of at the time current scientific theories. This was granted something written I think in the 80s. I'm actually gonna have to check that. Yeah, the first book was published in 1982. Wow, that's old. Yes, I'm putting that in there for my parents, who can feel even older. Maya. Dylan. Can I question you on the next point on the script? <laughs> Always. Uh, great stuff about the Spider-Verse. <laughs> okay, so that is actually me going, wait a minute, this is like two steps from being funny. <laughs> <laughs> we just gotta get it the rest of the way. Because originally, I read the script, great stuff from across the spectrum. I'm like, wait a minute. If I change this one word, it's another Tronkle moment. <laughs> now, see, that's fair. Sometimes there's a joke no one will ever get but you, but you just gotta make it for yourself. And I respect that. Exactly. And the point of that was to highlight stuff from, from all ends of the spectrum. Stuff that is explicitly soft sci-fi. Stuff that's a little bit harder, and stuff that is very hard. I don't know why <laughs> my brain dropped those words, but it definitely did drop them. Challenge. Okay. Kind of related here. Can you think of a mecha show or whatever for each category? Oh, no, I can't. Um, hmm. I like so I, I am a mecha fan. It. I have not consumed anywhere near enough mecha to do that. I have um Pacific Rim, Lancer, and uh Gundam which for Mercury. Okay, let's think, think about this. I oh, don't and uh and one other. So I don't think you can get mecha lower than four. It just won't happen. I don't think you can get Mecha higher than five. I don't think you can get Mecha to five, actually. I, I don't think you can get Mecha to five. I, I know. Or, it's, sorry, it's we're, like... we're interpreting the scale different ways. I don't think you can get Mecha closer to reality than four. I agree with you. Yeah, it's... Yeah, since there is no, like, real-life <laughs> Mecha. Because existence of Mecha is the big lie itself. <laughs> yes, which Steam and I uh, are both mechanicals. Legs f***ing suck. Uh, mechanical engineer. By you can't. No one but us will recognize what that means here. <laughs> bah. The fun thing is, you can literally, based on that question, you can just put individual Sentai and Power Ranger seasons and Ultraman <laughs> in different places. Be like, mm hmm. You go there. Okay. You go there. I'm so, thinking. I'm thinking. Voltron number one. Voltron is one on the scale. Yeah. I forgot about Voltron. Battletech, number two. Battletech is a two, really? Or are you just listing them off? No, no, I am placing them on the scale. Okay, why do you disagree that Battletech is a number two? Oh, I'm just surprised. I, I don't consume Battletech media. I'm just like, huh, I always thought it was higher than a two. Okay, here's the thing about Battletech. Your mech is firing a snub-nosed battleship cannon. And if it hits another mech, that will bounce off out from a blade of armor that converts inbound energy directly into... I don't... I don't understand how Battletech armor... Let me phrase it like this. Battletech armor works like a video game hit bar because it is a video game hit bar. <laughs> they, they just didn't want... 
to add another layer of abstraction so it works the same way in the setting that it does in the game. <laughs> where, where does Poplar um, Mecha Anime Attack on Titan go? <laughs> uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Battletech is a two. Very detailed rules in the setting. No relation to physics. I feel like Sent- Sentai is like an like depending Sentai and Power Rangers, they gotta be like a free. <laughs> oh, okay. Two and what are easy. I don't know where what three and four are. I, I just told you it's Power Rangers, I, obviously. <laughs> I think a lot of Gundam shows fall under three. I think No, I none of the I, ones I've watched. <laughs> I've heard. I want to watch the original Gundam one day. I have not yet. But what I have heard is that the original Gundam makes a valiant attempt at justifying the three. You don't think you don't think G-Witch is a three? I uh, I G-Witch doesn't spend enough time justifying itself. To place it on the scale, I feel like it's Hmm. weird. I because it's not G-Witch. What G-Witch is very good at doing, I feel like, is giving you just enough information about the setting that you don't need to know anything else for the plot to work. That also means that I don't really know how the setting So I don't... I don't have enough information to place it. If, if only the first two series of Sentai had Mecha, yeah, they would fit in... I, I could see them fitting in a three. Uh, no, a four, sorry. Because they don't even fight monsters in there. They just fight, like, powered-up <laughs> Japanese evil people. Although, I will say, the fact that the final episode has ends the way it does, I feel like... I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Where the the that. thing that gets me is the gunned format stuff. That makes me say I don't even know if it can be a three, because that's just it's just not related to real world physics. Oh, this it's question weird. is racked rack our brains. <laughs> remember, remember, a three doesn't have to have real world physics. The physics can be invented to justify it's- the story. I-, I think the three has to have some degree of real world physics working in. Right, because if you go back to Honor Harrington, right? Sure. The propulsion systems are magic, but once you get past the fact that they have magic engines, everything else is basically real physics. Well, except for the tree cats. There are also psychic powers. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Consent. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. I had, I had just so accepted that as part of the setting that I completely forgot about it. There was a Power Rangers season that I think might be able to squeeze in a free. It was what. So I think RPM manages to fit in there because it's one of the exclusively this is a science series. Uh, The bad guys uh, are robots who took over the world <laughs> and the good guys use mecha to beat up those robots when they grow big so okay i'm trying to fit i'm thinking for there's a show a show i've been trying to convince you to watch by a uh-oh but i have not watched strong recommendations from the lancers task though oh called obsolete it's a weird one season direct to YouTube original. Because I guess that YouTube was trying to get shows actually on the platform, and then people were like, wow, YouTube sucks as a TV platform. Never took off. But they exist, right? So anyway, the show is called Obsolete, and the premise of it is what what if aliens showed up and just started selling us Max? This sounds like we should watch this as soon as possible. Yeah, I know. But So the premise is, aliens show up in orbit, and for one ton of limestone, they will trade you a mech pellet. 
one ton of limestone. <laughs> one ton of limestone. Limestone. Who knows what they want with it? Anyway, now, here's the thing. Anyone on the planet can get a mech skeleton, and it's not that hard to get a ton of limestone. It really it's is really not. not. Especially given that uh, where I grew up, there's a lot of limestone. Yeah, no kidding. So, now that anyone can get a mech skeleton for all intents and purposes, any organization can get a mech skeleton. We don't know how to make mech skeletons. They're physically impossible to us, but that's not important right now. We have them. What happens now? <laughs> I, I think the answer is slap a bunch of metal on it and then strap explosives to it. Guys, guys, I found a five. Uh, you've oh hit me. Uh, a I'm mecha in. five. Yeah, obviously. Uh, go we, on. It's been staring us in the face. I need you to hit me with it like a f***ing brick. Guys, what what about what about Genlock? I <laughs> shut the hell up. <laughs> hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Genlock. Genlock is a two. Yeah, no, it's uh as someone who works in a nanoparticles lab, it's a two. Yeah. It's, it's if, a... if it's got nanomachines, that's like hard locked at a two, maybe a two five. It's a two, because much like the number two, Genlock is shit. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Genlock season one is fine. Is it great? No. Is it fine? Could it be a lot better? Yes. It's I a don't know why you're talking about rooster season. teeth, of course, so. I don't know why you're putting all these qualifiers in. that You act like there's something beyond season one of Genlock. Is there? I know, it's a shame they never continued it. Yeah, yeah sure. man, really yeah. it's a shame. It's such a good show. Yeah. I, like I think, I think we do have to be careful here that about, about conflating any um, quality of a show with where it falls on the scale. Yes, so I don't think this scale is an indication of quality in any way. It is not. That is actually something that I wanted to bring up and then never put in the script, so thank you for reminding me of it. S something that the scale was partly in some of the early days of usage, it was used to deride stuff that was lower on the scale, which is cringe. If you do that, I'd like to lock you in a box while we have a recording of Cam's voice saying cringe is dead at you for nine hours. <laughs> 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 That's all of all areas of the scale are valid. Uh, one of my genuinely really favorite sci-fi works is it's a one. It's it's a one, fundamentally. The Janitors of the Post-Apocalypse series by Jim C. Hines. I love it. And actually, I think socially, it is more of like a three or a four. In terms of like a social hardness, I think it's more real. It's one of the more realistic depictions of socially how alien civilizations would interact with human language but yeah no it's a one it's it is future fantasy it is yeah i love so, it but it's not hard sci-fi at all uh so with that uh want to go on to our next thing thank you dylan for keeping us on track <laughs> advice my advice ignore everything do what you do but it is useful to know, like, uh, what what you're going for. If you are going for, you know, a softer thing, you know, it, then it's kind of useful to know, okay, how far can I go before I'm writing outside of what, I, you know, what I want to write? That's what I would say is, like, the usefulness of this is if you want to be somewhere specific... Because I think it's pretty easy to know when you're in six and one. But if you want to be like, ah, I want to be, you know, this sort of thing, like, let's say a four. Like, okay, what do I need to do to avoid being a five? And what do I need to put in to make sure? You know, that's yeah. my advice for using it is if you want to be somewhere specific, you this is useful. 
If you are one or six, you know what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, something I will say is that five plus on the hardness scale for sci-fi is very difficult. There is a lot of research that is kind of necessary to pull that off. And not everyone <laughs> wants to do that. So if that's not your cup of tea, but you still want to do something kind of with like hard sci-fi vibes, I think a four works perfectly for that. Uh, and you can still tell a lot of really interesting stuff. The, the thing I would advise on that I'm sure Steamed would say as well, and we've been kind of harping on, is... And this is something I got from Sanderson's writing, is the way he talks about it, is that limitations are a lot more interesting than just being super powerful. So use, use the rules of physics and science as limits, and then look for the loopholes in those rules, because I guarantee you people have already done the hard work there. And so there is something really neat that people are already talking about and know about. I think the way I like to approach world building is like, what are the rules? What is possible? What is not possible? I like that approach. I think that's a strong approach. I think that's a lot of Sanderson's approach. I, don't, I think that's an interesting part of the story. I think knowing what characters can and can't do is important to making sure there is weight to the plot. Yes, I concur. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do we have anything in the mailbag today, Ian? Nothing new today. So if you want to contact us about anything uh, we've talked about, um, Shoot us an email. Our address is fanfictapes at gmail.com. You can also leave us a comment on our YouTube or a review on Apple Podcasts. We also have a uh, social media presence on the website formerly known as Twitter. Maya, you run that channel. Do we have anything Yes, there? I do. Someone should send us some DMs because I don't get any. And we are at Fanfiction Takes with a capital F and a capital T in the usual places. You know, like if you're doing Camel Case. All right, folks, you heard her. Slide into Maya's DMs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I am and have been Maya. I am and always will be Dylan. I am currently Steve. And I am tired. I mean, Ian. Bye! <laughs> <laughs>